We've got uh, a, a quick uh, webinar for you today, about an hour or so, and, and we'll take questions. Uh, Nathan and I will take questions from you as long as we need to, if it's 20 minutes or an hour, however long you want to stay on. But we'll go through about an hour of, of uh, uh, lecture and discussion here on the topic of, of growing vegetables year-round. So um, with that, we're going to jump right in here. I'm going to hand it over here very quickly to my colleague, uh, Nathan Johanning. And uh, Nathan is new to us, and uh, what, Nathan, you've got probably three months under your belt with us I, now? I'm right at three months, I think, within a day or so of it, so. Okay. So, and Nathan's got a, a, a good background uh, and practical experience in, in small farms and local foods, and he comes to us from Southern Illinois University, and, and he is a grower also, so he's one of those unique individuals that we have that has a lot of training and expertise and then has on-the-ground experience with these. So at this point, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to shut my mic off, and uh, Nathan, you can take it over here, and you can advance slides. It's all under your control now. All right, that sounds good. Well, we'll uh, go ahead and get started. And again, I uh, want to uh, thank you guys for, uh, for joining us today. So, so the biggest thing with respect to growing throughout the, uh, throughout the year is there's four main keys, especially throughout the uh, fall and winter season. And we're going to hit on these and kind of expand on them throughout the course of the next hour or so. So the biggest thing, use of cold tolerant crops, uh, timely plantings, the use of crops that have multiple harvests, so something you can harvest multiple times, and then you need to worry about the protection of the crop. So if those four main things are kept in mind, that those, are, those things will get you off to a really good start as far as making sure you have success at uh, growing things throughout the year. So to start off with, so we're talking about growing things in a time of year when we typically have uh, some freezing conditions. So how are plants able to survive that? Well, uh, basically multiple freezing and thawing in many, in most plants causes them more or less the cells to bust mainly because of the expansion of the frozen, of the water inside those cells that water crystals are very sharp once they're frozen and then that causes a disruption of those cells and therefore once the cells bust, the plant uh, obviously succumbs shortly thereafter. But there are some plant species, some that are more what we would say uh, cold tolerant, that are able to overcome this and kind of negotiate these cooler temperatures. So what these plants do is they basically decrease their water content in the coldest times of the year, they're basically able to increase the uh, soluble sugars or salts in, the, in their uh, vascular system to in order for them to actually survive and still maintain a low level of water, even though we have growing conditions that are below freezing. So the same concept of, you know, we use salt to, uh, to uh, thaw out the snow and things, ice off of roads, even when it's below 32 degrees. Well, basically the plants have a higher salt concentration, sugar concentration that allows those cells not to freeze, even though it's below uh, 32 degrees outside. So that's some basics of how plants actually uh, can achieve this. So whenever we talk about growing in the uh, in season, especially late fall and early winter, um, we need to understand some basic things, of course, about heat and light and how they play a role in, uh, in the plants and how we need to think differently maybe in this, in this time of year versus during growing during the spring and summer. So we get heat comes from both uh, solar radiation and just from the Earth's uh, ambient temperature. So we have, you know, plants need the sunlight, but then also that sunlight also brings us heat and allows us to uh, basically, the earth will, of course, traps and stores that heat and that allows for the adequate temperatures and then the radiation also allows for the sunlight that plants need to undergo photosynthesis and, uh, and uh, produce more biomass. So how are these conditions different? Well, of course, during summer, we have excessive light and heat, so those things usually are an issue. So 
management practices are geared towards keeping things plants cool so they're not exceeding their critical temperatures and so that's something we have to deal with in the summer. Fall and winter is a completely different setup. In that case we have light and heat are very limited and we'll talk specifically kind of break this down and talk more about this as we go but uh, we need to capture all the light and heat as efficiently as possible during this time of year. So we also need to maintain a growing environment, which is that heat and light, which is our goal. As most of you know, of course, the angle of the sun's rays do change throughout the year with the most direct sunlight coming uh, in uh, mid-June and then the most indirect in December. So in this case, you know, we're talking about growing in some of the times we have the most indirect sunlight. So this just gives a basic illustration of that, and I think we've all uh, had a decent understanding, but it's something that we really need to remember whenever we're talking about growing in this season because it affects the intensity of light, and therefore that's going to greatly dictate plant growth and how that occurs so we need to make sure that we're planning our fall and winter production to work around these uh, differences not only in day length but also in light intensity. So also with that if you have say a cold frame or something that you're trying to um, set up you know the more angle you have on the roof of that because especially more angled towards the south the more light you're going to intercept in the winter time uh, compared to during the summer. You can get away with, uh, of course, uh, different uh, angles because we have a, uh, the sun is up at a higher angle. So even if you don't have a, have a fairly flat surface or covering, you're still going to get a great deal of light through there. So with respect to light management, just as some examples, so uh, in this, you know, in Illinois, roughly we have around nine hours of daylight in December compared to a day length of around 16 hours in June. So we have this difference in day length. So does that just mean that we have half of the light in uh, December versus in June? Or is it more complicated than that? Well, the answer is actually no, it's not quite that simple because of this fact that we just talked about with not only is it the day length that's in play, but it's also the light intensity is drastically decreased compared to during the summer months. So because of this, this brings up a concept of the daily light integral. So basically what this is, is just a measurement of the actual amount of light that uh, we are receiving just a measurement in moles per square meter, so just in measurement of light per per, uh, per unit of uh, surface area that you're getting. So you can have this range from anywhere from 2.5 to 50 moles per day. Um, so that's a factor of 20 that you can get 20 times more light. So that's a great difference. That's far more than just half. So that just goes to show how much it's more than just day length involved. You know, a cloudy day in December, you can have maybe just a fraction of the light that a sunny day in June might have. So because of this, this leads into the fact that we need to uh, we need to try to take and have our plants for the fall season get a good healthy start before we get into these cloudy December days. So that way the bulk of their uh, root growth and establishment of the plants can occur during these higher light conditions. And then we can just have, kind of have plants more in a maintenance mode during the uh, rest of the season. So overall with the, uh, with the DLI, if this drops below 10 for the day, this is where we get a slower growth in plants. So most of the time, this is when we get in that December to January time frame. So that's kind of our baseline. And these numbers just give you some uh, basic numbers to kind of equate to how, um, say, the summertime versus wintertime compares with respect to uh, day length and also the light that you will get. Um, and so that's, 
you know, we can have that kind of a drop in the uh, DLI, but also remember that things such as your coverings for your greenhouse or high tunnel or row covers also reduce light. So you already have a season when naturally, you know, in fall and winter we'll have less light available, period, and lower light intensities, but in addition to that, we also have the structures we use to protect the plants. Those are also limiting the light. So because of that, um, you know, we have to also account for that and just work as hard as we can to maximize the uh, efficiency of any light that we do have and can get uh, access to. So also we need to, in addition to light, we need to manage temperature. So you can uh, look at the average daily temperature and what we have for cool season crops. Once you get to near freezing, you have very little if no growth. Uh, the plants are still alive and they're still, um, you know, still are slowly growing, but you're not getting that same kind of growth that you would at temperatures above that. So in this case, if you have, say, between the uh, maximum and the uh, minimum temperatures needed, if you had 25 degrees, um, in many cases you can have, um, for every 5 degrees, you're getting an additional, um, you know, additional 20, 25% amount of growth to those plants. So every couple degrees above that minimum we're getting, you're getting increases in growth. But once you're at or maybe below that minimum, um, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have less and less growth. So that's something we need to think about and that kind of goes back into the fact of getting things started early. So also- Nathan, just another, another thing, Nathan, I, I think you'll get to a little bit later too. Five degrees doesn't seem like much, but when you're in those growing conditions, you can see that five degrees amounts to about 25% increase in growth. So Nathan will talk about here a little bit later on row covers and things like that. You may not gain a lot of, of uh, temperature with those, but in that time of year, that really means a lot. Sure. No, that's, uh, that is, is definitely right. I mean, um, the difference between 35 and 40 degrees, you can, you know, even in that, you can see a great deal of difference. So, you know, and then, uh, so kind of going along, continuing with temperature management, uh, soil temperature can be influenced, is a big influencing factor in plant growth, uh, and that can be influenced by the amount of sunlight, the amount of moisture in the soil, and just the overall air temperature. So obviously the soil temperature, you know, monitor this in your, especially if you're in a high tunnel or under, uh, you know, maybe low tunnels or whatever it may be, but it's a very good indicator of your overall energy or the temperature that you have in that structure or that environment that you're trying to grow plants. So remember if uh, the soil is very dry, it is likely to be very cold, just as cold as the air temperature. There's less density, there's, uh, that soil has, is full of uh, more air spaces, so therefore you tend to have it, um, have less buffering against differences and fluctuations in temperature. But if you have the soil to be very moist, that water kind of acts as an insulator. It has, that soil has, that soil system, water, air, and the minerals all together has a greater mass, so it takes more energy to actually change the temperature. Of that. So if you have a moist soil, it will drop down to close to around freezing, but it's going to stay there and uh, it's going to resist some of that change. Uh, as water freezes, there is some heat released, um, and uh, because of that, uh, that can keep the temperature from falling below 32 degrees as long as there is still some of that freezing process uh, actively continuing. So that's why in some cases, even though we might have a drastic drop in temperature, um, the soil will maintain a uh, temperature of right at freezing for multiple days or nights um, after that air temperature has dropped just because you have that uh, heat of uh, basically the heat that's released during freezing, the freezing process. So some of these basic things can help to uh, help you basically manipulate your environment better to promote the uh, plant's 
uh, continued growth. So that's just some kind of basic concepts to keep in mind. Now we're just going to go to some images here and some uh, life examples that we have of real life, what goes on during some of these cold seasons in the high tunnel. So most of these images here are from, and some examples are from our St. Charles Research Center and uh, the high tunnel that we have up there. So in this case, we have, this is a very uh, cold January morning. This is on uh, the 3rd of January. We had 11 degrees very early in the morning outside. However, uh, whenever we go inside, we can see this is still our 11 degrees outside. We go in and we have uh, right around 20 degrees or maybe a hair over that inside the high tunnel. So even at that, we're still well below freezing. But you can see we have just with the high tunnel, just the ambient air temperature, we have gained you know, almost 10 degrees just in that in inside environment there. Now, if we look at that same day, so we started off at 11 degrees. Now we're up to 10.30 a.m., so a little later in the morning. We've had some more sunlight. You can see that in this case, we have uh, outside, we've moved up to around 20 degrees, but we're up to almost 50 degrees inside. So you can see you can rapidly gain a lot of, uh, a lot of heat units for added plant growth inside. Even though it might be very, very cold outside, you can still have temperatures, you know, approaching really, uh, you know, really I somewhat ideal uh, growing conditions, especially for some of these cool season plants. So you can see also the crops at 10.30 in the morning, things are starting to perk up. Oftentimes some of these plants under these very cold conditions, especially with greens, which you see here, leaves will kind of become somewhat limp and they will um, basically, they won't look quite as happy, but as temperatures raise back up, get above freezing, the plants perk back up and they start to, uh, to regain their turgor and uh, kind of regain their, uh, basically regain their um, uh, normal uh, normal look. So here you can see more just the crop starting. You can see some of the some of the uh, plants there, how the leaves are still kind of hanging over, but others you can see the leaves are starting to perk up and they're really starting to uh, snap back out of that uh, cold that they had undergone over throughout the night. So moving on, just looking at later in that day around 2.30, you know, we're still not above freezing outside, but we're up to almost 60 degrees inside that, uh, inside that tunnel. So in that case, that's really beneficial to help keep, especially, you know, some of these greens that really do thrive in some of these temperatures and these 50 to 60 degree temperatures. You know, this is, uh, even though it started off cool, very cold, um, you know, kind of uh, a lot more ideal conditions. And this is, you know, in the heart of winter. So this is where you can, some of these structures can really help you to gain this, indeed, this year-round production. So just some more kind of structural things to think about whenever you're trying to get the, your, maximize your thermal performance. So how many layers of poly do you want on a high tunnel? So do you want one layer or two? I will have to say a lot of the high tunnels that I'm seeing uh, most commonly have one. But if you're really wanting to focus on having um, year-round production, you know, especially some of these greens, it might be good to think about having a second layer. And we can see here the uh, uh, picture to the right here. If you have a second layer, usually what we do is we want to try to basically insert air between those two layers of plastic because if those two layers of plastic are compressed together, basically you're getting uh, very little benefit from that second layer. But if we can take a, a small fan, as you see here, and you'll couple that uh, through the inside layer of plastic so that way you are pumping air between those sheets, um, basically, in that case, you're providing an air space between those, and that air is acting as an insulator between those two sheets, and you can gain a lot more, um, a lot more um, protection and insulation from uh, co cool temperatures and cold temperatures outside by having a double layer. So that's something to consider 
uh, whenever you're uh, setting up a, a high tunnel and trying to determine how you want to approach that. Uh, also, uh, insulate the perimeter, so around the edge, and we'll talk about that just a little bit more here in the next slide. And also the end walls. So, you know, use, it could be anywhere from, you know, just using something rather than plastic, maybe using a uh, polycarbonate or which more or less is kind of a uh, corrugated, I guess you could say, um, uh, material that would give you some extra insulation on those end walls. Um, that will, anything you can do to help to insulate will only give you more and more uh, benefit out of your structure. So with some of the perimeter insulation, a part of this would be adding, especially uh, for cold conditions, adding a foam board type insulation from the soil surface down anywhere from a foot to a foot and a half um, below the ground. And what this does is this provides a insulation between the soil inside your tunnel and then the soil outside because, you know, overall the soil, uh, you know, your, you know, if your high tunnel is 30 by 96, you know, you have a, a very small fraction whenever you look at the entire mass of soil that is around, you know, outside that, you know, you have a very small fraction you're trying to change. So more than likely you're going to get some continuity and that cold from the soil outside the tunnel is going to help to cool the soil inside your tunnel. So by providing a basically some insulation and barrier in there, what you can do is you can help to mitigate that and keep the soil that would, uh, that cold soil that's outside and not under your high tunnel, trying to keep that from moving too much of the uh, transferring too much of that cold into the soil inside the tunnel. So this can give you, uh, give you a lot of uh, insulating effects. So also hey, let's, case, let's take a quick, Nathan, let's just take a quick question or two here. Um, a compost pile inside the tunnel, would that help heat it up? Um, I would say that it can help, uh, can help some, although I don't know, um, I guess I haven't tried that. I don't know, Kyle, do you have any thoughts on that? I could see it potentially helping, but in the grand scheme of things, I'm not sure how much, you know, how many degrees you would gain. Yeah, um, I have some, I have some growers I work with that, that use hot beds in there specifically for, you know, this type of thing. It doesn't really raise the temperature at all. It's more of an altering of the climate, you know, and the growing medium itself within that raised bed. So that, that's kind of how that works. Um, but I do have, and I do this myself, I have a high tunnel myself. I do use a combination also, we can talk a little more later on, but I use a combination of uh, cold frames within my tunnels too later in the year for growing. We can talk about that a little bit too to raise some temps. And I'll just catch that next question, Nathan. That insulation can be purchased from any any of the home improvement stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards. It's just a standard uh, foam 4 by 8 sheet of insulation. Yeah, any any of these things, um, you know, using the uh, any, any of these things that can uh, do to help insulate, um, you know, and it doesn't have to necessarily be, um, you know, things out of a greenhouse supply. I mean, just like say, these are things you can get um, at your, your your local store. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the, I guess the innovations that have come to, you know, us using high tunnels have been people, you know, just. Um, taking basic supplies and, uh, you know, just trying to adapt. So who knows what we'll uh, come up with uh, next. But going back to the compost, you know, the concepts, you know, that they used to use with uh, using like manure in a cold frame outside, you know, certainly if you have, uh, you know, that, that concept can certainly be used, but uh, that's uh, another thing that, uh, you know, another tool that can help. So. Our, our colleague, everyone make note sure. there on the chat, our colleague Deborah Cavanaugh Grant in Springfield uh, put up a link there to uh, a SARE project that talks a little bit more about that. So be sure and uh, keep that keep that link. Thank you, Deborah. Yes, thank you. Uh, so also uh, row covers are also important. So if you have a high tunnel, that's one step, but also that you can also gain even beyond 
just having uh, the high tunnel itself. So you can basically uh, use row covers or create kind of small what we call low tunnels inside your high tunnel. That's kind of what you see, see here. It's just where you have a lower structure with a covering inside the, uh, the high tunnel itself. So this can provide up to eight degrees of frost protection. It varies on uh, kind of the overall conditions and, of course, the weight of the row cover. There's different thicknesses of the row cover, just like if uh, you know, just like if you're uh, if you're cold, if you are, are you going to stay warmer with a sheet over you or with a blanket over you? So there's all kinds of different uh, weight of row covers that you can use. The one thing with them is though they do need to be managed daily, especially whenever they're used inside a high tunnel, because you can easily get too much heat um, for those plants, and you can take them to too much of an extreme by having basically two layers of protection with a high tunnel and then basically having the row cover over the top of it. So it's the type of thing you would want to manage and open up in the morning and then cover in the evening. So it does take... Um, so it does take uh, quite a bit of some extra maintenance. So a lot of times a half ounce row cover is, uh, is good to use, especially for inside a high tunnel. And then if you need additional frost protection or cold protection, um, you can add a double layer if needed. <clears throat> so some other things with respect to the temperature and the environment. Make sure, especially for growing throughout the late fall and winter, make sure to keep the soil exposed. Your organic mulches are, are really good insulators, but in this case, they're probably going to keep the cold in rather than letting, uh, letting you keep some of that warmth uh, that you would want to be gaining from this environment you're creating above the soil. Also, um, it does not benefit as much to use plastic mulch. So plastic mulch where we use that, uh, especially black plastic, say for maybe early spring production, this is efficient in that case because there we're getting greater light intensity, more sunlight, and what you're, uh, you're gaining more of the effectiveness of having that dark surface and having that absorb light. Late fall and early winter, we have so many times that we don't have enough light intensity to have that black plastic really be useful. Sometimes what it does is it just makes a plastic barrier between the warmer air temperature you may have in your tunnel and the soil. So it actually doesn't provide as much benefit when you're talking about planting things in that uh, late fall, especially th throughout the winter, as it does if you're doing plantings in high tunnels for say, March plantings, trying to get early start for uh, summer crops. Nathan, let's, let's ask uh, the people we have online here. I'm kind of curious. How many, uh, how many of you um, are actually, how many of you have grown, uh, you know, fall and winter crops, or is this kind of your first exposure to it? Not a lot. It looks like, I think, I think we have a lot of, uh, um, uh, people that this is going to be new to, so that can help us a little bit, Nathan. And, and then if I could, real quick, I'm going to jump back one. Uh, you, Nathan and I talked a little bit about this yesterday. On the row covers, and especially with high tunnels, you, you kind of have to think when you're growing vegetables in the fall and winter, you think the opposite of what you did in, in the summer. Uh, seems intuitive, but you have to manage these row covers as actively as you did in the summer, managing your um, you know, the sides of your high tunnel and, and opening them up, you know, and getting heat out of that tunnel during July. We well, have to do the same with the uh, row covers. You don't leave the row covers on all day. Uh, you'll take them on and off as needed, you know, every day. But uh, you, you basically will end up spending, you know, not as much time as you did, you know, in July in a tunnel, but you'll spend a lot of time managing these row covers so that, you know, you're retaining heat and letting letting the plants get what they need. So it's just you just kind of have to change your your frame frame of thought. So I'll get I'll get back to you there. To, All right. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Thank thank you for that uh, for that, Kylie. That's it's uh, you know the management is definitely something that uh, you know is you know it's not just you know cover them up and they'll be there. You know you still need to actively manage them even though they're not growing quite as actively as they would be during the summer. 
So with that, you know, talking about managing the row cover, so basically you're creating like an igloo effect. You're trying to create a microclimate in there. So maybe on a cold day, maybe it's in the in the tunnel itself, maybe it's down to um, maybe 25 degrees in the tunnel, but underneath your row cover, maybe it's 32 degrees. So, you know, and maybe it's only 20 outside. So you have this gradient. Each layer is giving you a little bit more uh, effectiveness. You do, especially on sunny days, you need to um, open those covers and uh, basically allow them so once the sun comes out, so that way the plants are getting the sunlight and also that way you're heating up that environment there and then whenever, as far as covering them again, you want to cover them, you know, as the sunlight tends to uh, decrease in intensity, you don't want to wait until things have gotten really cold and cover them. You want to try to capture some of that heat from hopefully a sunny day and try to help to keep that in under that row cover. Uh, and as I said before, in some cases you might want to use uh, two layers of, uh, of row cover under very cold conditions just to help to give you that extra, uh, extra insulation and try to keep that microclimate around the plants uh, at a, as optimal as you can for plant growth. So next we're just moving into, uh, you know, talking about things to plant. Um, you can see there's differences, great differences in varieties. So you see these bed here, you have three different varieties of spinach and you can obviously see from looking at them that, that uh, especially the one in the middle is doing a lot better than especially the one to the left. Um, but so d variety selection is extremely important for this. So, um, you know, we're going to talk about next some things to think about and how to figure out what you need to grow and what varieties you need to grow. So in addition to that, there's a couple other uh, issues that can be uh, problematic early in the season. Um, downy mildew, uh, this is a pathogen that can basically um, be problematic from having condensation on the leaves from the, the human environment that sometimes we have. Um, you can get resistant varieties to that and that's something to look into, especially if you have issues. Also aphids can be an, uh, can be an issue. Uh, in the case of aphids, um, you can do a spot treatment or if it's just on a single plant, uh, rogue the plant, sacrifice it, get the, those aphids out if they're on one specific plant and so that way you can uh, basically keep them from being uh, a major issue. But those are some things to think about. Um, you know, you create this nice little microclimate, but unfortunately there's some insects and pathogens that also like this environment. So just know that um, that can be an issue and just if it's uh, monitored and managed, it can be, uh, can be indeed managed, but if not, if you don't uh, aren't paying attention to these things, sometimes you can get, say with aphids, get an outbreak of them and, uh, and have some issues. So what do you need to plant? Well, we already established cold tolerant crops. So these are things, your late fall, winter, or overwinter type crops. So basically, whenever you're doing this, you need to not only balance um, the type of crops that will grow, but also remember, especially if you're looking to sell uh, on a market, you need to balance the um, hardiness and marketability of those. So you need to, if you're going to sell, you need to make sure it's something that um, people are going to buy. If you have an entire, um, not to pick on any one crop, but if you have an entire tunnel full of, say, some really good uh, winter turnips, but if you just don't have people that have a taste for them or want those or whatever crop it may be, you need to make sure that what you're growing is something that uh, people want. So the biggest thing is you're trying to extend the harvest season. Uh, you know, even if you can't, you know, not all crops are necessarily going to um, maybe be able to produce for the en entire season, but maybe you can extend one and maybe some of the greens you can get to produce throughout the uh, season and just trying to overall get as much uh, and m as much and as long of a growing season as you can. So in general, some things to plant, of course, and your greens, your uh, lettuce, spinach, kales, and things such as that. 
such as that are uh, very good to plant. A lot of your root crops such as carrots, beets, turnips, uh, radishes, parsnips, those are all uh, fairly uh, cold hardy. Uh, some of the alliums are things such as in the leeks, green onions. Um, there's also, I didn't, and this didn't get in here, also some of the brassicas, things such as broccoli, cauliflower. These are all, uh, all ones, uh, plants and crops that are fairly, um, basically fairly cold tolerant and will be able to survive in this environment. And we're not, we had a link to Johnny's Seeds there, which probably a lot of people know. We're not endorsing them, but we have that link up there because Johnny's, their catalog, their online catalog and their paper catalog do a, a really, really good job at, at uh, guiding you towards uh, the type of variety that, that you need for the conditions you have. So they have a really good uh, a catalog to look at that you should be looking at in other catalogs, you know, in terms of what you should be buying. Sure. Uh, no, that's, uh, you know, they have a good resource, and I'm sure there's others, and, you know, and we'll talk here later on, you know, use multiple resources along with, um, you know, learning some on your own to figure out, you know, what works for you. So what I have listed here, and I won't go through this just in uh, entirety, but this is kind of some minimum temperatures that some of these uh, different plants will tolerate. So you start off with some of your cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, and some of those have uh, tolerance to around 25 degrees. It depends. Sometimes it could maybe be a little cooler than that. Um, and then it moves down through things such as um, beets and some of your mustard greens can go down to around 20, uh, then on down to some of your uh, carrots and winter radishes and uh, leeks and other things that are extremely cold tolerant. So it just gives you an idea. Um, all of these can be grown, but obviously the deeper you get into winter, you're probably going to you know, want to uh, look more towards some of these that have some of the, um, basically some of the lower minimum temperatures that they can still survive and, and grow in. So the next, this next slide is just kind of a listing of some of the things that uh, we had put together as far as variety selections. Now obviously there are constantly new varieties coming out, so, um, and we'll talk more later. This is just some places for you to start off with. Um, but, um, you know, feel free to look, I mean, there's, and, uh, don't, uh, don't limit yourself, I guess is what I'm trying to say to just these things, explore and look, there's always new things coming out, um, and they will have recommendations on what will work. And so we don't, unfortunately don't have good, uh, uh experiences with every variety out there, but we'll at least give you a few things to get you started. So with respect to, you know, in this and broccoli, we have a few uh, cabbage and chard. There are just some different varieties that you want that have been shown to have worked for late season and winter production. So some things to look at, you know, you want to look at recommendations on how cold hardy they are. Um, uh, some things that I do look at, especially even um, for broccoli or some of these things that you need to start uh, a little bit further is I tend to look just a little bit um, at some of their, even some of their summer bearing qualities, especially if you want it to be maybe a mid to late fall crop, because you don't, some of these, if you try to get them established in late summer, they, you know, you want to make sure they'll tolerate that. That's especially important for like your broccoli and cabbage and things. Some of these others have a shorter season, so in those cases you can get them started late enough that you don't have to worry about some of that uh, excessive heat. But overall, these are some initial kind of varieties to give you a start and give you some ideas on. But the biggest thing, and I think uh, Kyle and I both agree on this, is that you need to do some experimentation on your own, especially with respect to varieties. Um, there's, uh, we have a publication, the Midwest uh, Vegetable Production Guide, um, which is a really good for some basic planting information like plant spacings. It gives you some good starting foundation and it does have some variety um, listings. But in addition to that, there's so much more information out there. Use your seed catalogs and other things for their recommendations on how things do, and especially late or uh, late 
uh, late plantings or cold uh, season plantings. And do your own research. I bet we can uh, get our colleague Deborah to bring up that link for that Midwest pro uh, sure. vegetable right. production dice. She's really good at that. And I, and I, I should have had this. This uh, on the screen is actually a link, but I don't know that in this case that that really uh, uh, is very profitable uh, for us at the uh, us at the moment. But uh, but yeah, with that, uh, do your own uh, do your own research. So try some other varieties. So if there are you know a handful, maybe five different varieties of something that they say are you know cold tolerant, try all five of those in a small area. See what you uh, see what works for you. Uh, there are so many regional differences, even within Illinois and other areas. There's some things that maybe aren't necessarily as well suited, maybe by the books for maybe cold production, but maybe the environment that you've created for it, um, maybe it does thrive under that. So just try them and see what works for you. And along with that, we'll reemphasize this later: is make good records of it. So keep a you know, even if it's just a small notebook saying, you know, hey, this, even just write down the varieties in a good or bad or, you know, just a couple brief comments on them so that way you're not scrambling the next season trying to think, now what varieties did I plant last year? Um, I know one was good, but I can't remember it. I, you know, I can't stress. I mean, even for me, there's times I wished I wrote down more than what I did. So make sure you uh, do that. You know, another thing so I did... Uh, excuse me, Nathan. Uh, sure. our, Deborah got the link up for everybody, so it'll take it to the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide. And then I'll just catch a quick question that several people might have. The, the one from Kankakee is, do you need a high tunnel since some plants can tolerate cold temperatures? And and remember that most most of this, uh, the, the clientele that we work with are commercial growers, so they're wanting to do, you know, some pretty extensive growing, this type of thing. But, you know, if you don't have a high tunnel, you can grow you grow a lot of these plants. We might ask Nathan about that. The big difference would be that, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to grow as long probably, you know, without these structures. Uh, and, and the other thing, too, is when we talk about structures, uh, I mentioned cold frames. Uh, you saw earlier in the chat, we talked a little bit about if you have raised beds. Uh, you can build these mini, basically it's a mini high tunnel with cold frames and, and PVC pipe on raised beds to do the exact same things that we're talking about. So you don't have to have a high tunnel to do this. The commercial people that we work with and, and target, you know, they're obviously going to do that because they're, they're in the market and they want to sell these vegetables. But uh, it's all a matter of scale. No, I would, uh, I completely agree with Kyle. I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, appreciate the uh, that question. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, basically, uh, you know, I'd have to agree. I I don't have. Uh, I'm not lucky enough to have a high tunnel like uh, like Kyle does. But I have grown things. Actually, one of the things that I grow personally, I grow some uh, uh, broccoli in the fall. I usually get it started um, maybe around uh, first of July. Get it set out. I haven't basically worked uh, worked with that. You know, multiple years. And, uh, you know, I, without a high tunnel, um, even on some mild years, um, broccoli, I've had broccoli up till even New Year's Day. That was a really mild year, but I could easily, um, with just some row covers and, you know, a heavier row cover and just putting it over, putting it over the plants, um, you could, you know, use, uh, you know, some basic, you know, PVC and other structures to build like a low tunnel. Um, you could uh, cover that uh, using a row cover or something, and you can get a lot of protection. So don't feel like you have to have a high tunnel. There are other things. And if anything, you can just plant crops. And, you know, I've done, if I don't want to mess with the uh, row cover, just harvest them up until you can. You can still get production out of some of these just by choosing cold-tolerant crops. You'll get production into, you know, the... Um, at least down here in southern Illinois, you know, the November, early December, if the uh, weather cooperates a little bit. So it's not, uh, it's not necessarily that um, you have to have this. This is one tool you can use, but there's many other things. So um, anyhow, going back to um, some experimenting, use an outdoor cemetery patch for, as you'd say, for varietal selection. So you know what works in the high tone, but if you have something that can survive the longest outdoors without any protection, that can give you 
a clear way to maybe choose some uh, potential profitable uh, crops that will tolerate uh, these conditions. So do a small patch, even if it's just, you know, five or ten plants. Um, it can help you to make some of those determinations on what can be best under some of these uh, cold conditions. And make sure, you know, you are planting varieties and things that can, you can basically carve out a winter niche within that winter produce market because, you know, there's certain things, obviously, if you can produce it, it is great, but you also, if you're going to sell and produce for those purposes, you need to make sure you have a market for it as well. So when to plant, um, you need uh, probably a succession of plantings depending on the crop, but usually starting in late summer. So where we're at right now is ideal for some of these. Actually, in some cases, it maybe even is a little bit late for some of the longer season crops, but definitely there's a lot of things you can still plant uh, right now. You want to plant a large enough volume so that it can carry you through the slow periods of regrowth. So during that time, you're going to have a lot of growth initially, but there'll be a long period where you're not going to get real fast regrowth on things like your lettuces or greens like that that you tend to get regrowth from. So you want to make sure that you are playing a large enough volume so you don't completely, um, completely uh, disregard and basically uh, uh, eliminate your entire crop all at once and then you don't have anything to carry you through uh, later in the year. Um, so like I said that uh, from November to February time is pretty slow growth so you can add up to uh, two weeks to four weeks maybe in the number of days to harvest um, that it would be from planting to harvest. So in that case just factor that in as you're kind of uh, calculating when to plant. And so basically determine when you want to harvest and then count backwards. So if you know the maturity of a given crop is, say, 90 days, maybe in a tunnel, uh, given later production, you might want to add maybe a couple weeks to that and then count backwards and plant then. Um, that's uh, the biggest thing is you want to make sure you get them started in time so that you aren't, don't have a seedling plant in, uh, you know, October or November trying to get established whenever it's not going to have enough time to do that appropriately. So overall, we have average frost-free period, um, you know, around April 15th, October 15th, obviously highly varies north and south, especially as we go throughout the state and the region. But with that, here's some general guidelines of when you would want to, roughly when you'd want to plant. Um, before the first frost. So around 12 to 14 weeks prior to first frost for broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, leeks. Again, it depends on when you want to harvest, but uh, the biggest thing is a lot of these plants, especially some of them, if you're starting seedlings, you're going to need maybe four or five weeks to get to the point where you could uh, transplant them and, you know, to have, you know, maybe uh, four to six leaves on them. So you need to get a, an early head start. Uh, also, uh, around 10 weeks for things like beets, some of the daikon, radishes, lettuce, and turnips, um, then on down to uh, lesser lengths of time for some of the winter radishes, kale, and then also spring spinach. So some other planting considerations. Um, uh, you can need to balance your space, crop size, and also how you're going to manage diseases. Um, with the, with your plantings, a lot of times you can plant more densely, especially with some of your greens and things, than you would in outside production because you don't necessarily get as much uh, vigorous growth uh, at all at one time. Raised beds are also another thing that can help. You know, if you have that soil raised up, that's going to warm more quickly than a uh, than not having a raised bed where you have that. Uh, uh, soil more continuous with, of course, the outside environment as well. Uh, plant seeds that are a little bit deeper than you would in this area in the spring, especially in the late summertime. You're going to have a little bit warmer soil in this, and in this case, you're going to, for some of these, especially if you're establishing them where it's a little bit warmer, um, you want to uh, make sure they're deep enough that they stay moist and they uh, are able to germinate and, uh, and start off well. You want to always, if you're, uh, in this case, start off with good soil tilth. You want to make sure you have uh, you know, your soil in good 
condition, if that means, you know, incorporating some um, compost or other things into it in the beds that you're going to use to make sure you have uh, optimal soil conditions, especially when you're trying to already grow under adverse temperature and light conditions. <coughs> The, uh, and then many direct seeded crops can be more cold tolerant than transplants, especially depends on how long b between the time of transplant and the time of your first frost. So you want to make sure, especially with the transplants, is if you transplant them out and you have a frost in a couple of weeks, they may not have as much time to establish, whereas something that's been direct seeded is more adapted to that, uh, especially, um, especially in this case, uh, uh, with some of these crops that uh, maybe haven't been hardened off or aren't as adjusted to this cooler climate uh, where you're uh, growing them in in these high tunnels. Nathan, I, a lot of people I work with, and I'm doing it myself, um, like for the, the choys, the pak choy and bok choy, they're usually transplanted out there, and um, uh, they are kind of a You've got to transplant those to get them, you know, sure. ahead of schedule early in there versus a direct seeding. So that that's relative to what you're talking about. With if you're going to grow any of the choys. Sure, and I uh, I think also um, with respect to like the broccoli and cauliflower and things, I usually those I would think things like that. I would probably say transplants would probably be your uh, your best start. But again, just making sure you keep them. Uh, get them out and uh, out in time to establish and uh, acclimate to that environment for any of those crops. So winter watering, uh, with uh, winter watering there's uh, lower water requirements for the plants because you have often a closed up very high humidity environment. Uh, you can have um, and also have less crop growth so you don't have as much water needed. Uh, drip tape can be useful, especially maybe early in the season, uh, early in the, uh, let's see, rephrase that, um, late in the winter, which would be early in your winter time growing season, or maybe in the late winter as you're approaching spring. But the thing to keep in mind with that for especially midwinter is you don't want those lines to freeze up with water and it might take a long time to get all of that water thawed. So there probably will be some times, especially in the midwinter, you'll probably do some, uh, um, basically some manual watering and not necessarily be able to rely on irrigation as much, depending on the temperatures you're able to maintain in your tunnel. And anytime you are watering, especially manual watering or overhead, you want to water during the middle of the day when it's milder, um, and you don't want to, uh, uh, you also don't want to water when the plants are still uh, potentially recovering from some cold temperatures or overnight. So the middle of the day is the best time to do that. And then also on some days that are warmer, do provide some ventilation. That way you can get some uh, some uh, fresh air in there. If you have, it can help to reduce your humidity, which you can which can build up, especially whenever you have, um, you know. A, a, these cool conditions and you have everything closed up for a longer period of time. <clears throat> so winter harvest considerations, especially um, uh, for some of these crops, like some of the greens, which are you kind of consider cut and come again crops, things that are going to continually harvest. Make sure you harvest in the middle of the day. You don't want to harvest um, especially early in the morning, maybe when crops are still maybe recovering from that cool night. Um, make sure you uh, don't cut them too low and harvest maybe anywhere from from 15 to 35 days, depending on the growing conditions on your crop and how vigorously it's growing. Whenever you're harvesting, don't remove more than 40% of your leaf area at any one time, just because if you do that, you're going to be limiting the growth of that plant. And it's, uh, going to take, uh, especially under the slow conditions, it's going to take longer for it to bounce back, and, uh, and it, the more stress you're putting on it by harvesting, you know, and the bottom line is you're, you know, if it would become an extra cold night, you're putting just that much more stress on the plant. So just you want to kind of selectively harvest, and uh, that way you can get a good continual harvest throughout the season. And uh, also use harvesting to thin your direct seeded plants. So if you have 
um, direct seeded and you, you know, want to seed maybe a little bit thick to ensure you have a good stand, do some earlier harvest to help thin those and still get some benefit from those extra plants that you have. And plan ahead because there may very well be times that you will have frozen ground and still uh, need to harvest. So as I hit on before, record keeping is key. So uh, winter production is more expensive. Um, you do have then obviously growing without uh, some of these structures or growing in the spring or summertime. Your harvests aren't often quite as big as what you would have during the summertime. So you need to keep records of these things, especially your time and labor, and make sure that if you're marketing these, that you're charging accordingly. You know, it isn't a sustainable system if you can't, um, you know, market these things for what it really does uh, cost you to produce them. And also along with, you know, the uh, labor, make sure you take, you know, good notes on, you know, if there's a really cold day, what some of the minimum temperatures were. So you can look back and say, you know, this is the temperatures I had and this is what, you know, I had uh, 20 degrees or, you know, inside the tunnel, it was only, um, you know, 15 or 10 outside. I had two layers of row cover on and this variety was able to survive. You know, some little notes like that can be really helpful so that whenever maybe the next year you're approaching a potential extra cold spell, you can look back and say, hey, here's what I did before and this worked or it didn't work and I need to do more. So use all those things to your benefit. And uh, remember, as far as the marketing perspective, it's not just necessarily about more money, but you want to make sure you're creating a audience that is very much satisfied with your uh, product and that you're going to promote them to want to buy more in the next year. So the, one of the last things here we have is just uh, um, some basic things just to kind of reiterate the um, some variety selection. This also gives you some basic plant spacing information, but just have to emphasize that the, your varieties you choose are very critical. So make sure you choose things that are more set towards the uh, fall or winter production. And then, like we said, um, make sure you do some research of your own and find out what works for you in the kind of micro and climate that you have, whether it be just a row cover, um, whether it be a just a small um, cold frame on the south side of your house, or whether it's a high tunnel with row covers in a commercial situation. Just test and see what works best for you. So overall, I think that hopefully that gives you at least a, uh, a taste into some of the ways that you can produce things uh, in the fall and winter time, and some hopefully gets you thinking about that. So does, uh, does anyone else at this time have any questions or entertain any questions? Um, I don't know, Kyle, is there any questions that I've overlooked in the chat or had a cost that we may want to address now? No, I think we've got most of them. The way this usually works is that that's kind of the end of the formal instruction here with Nathan. And uh, a lot of times over the lunch hour, people are just able to join on from 12 to 1, so we might have people leaving here real quick. But Nathan and I will stay on here as long as people have questions. So as you have questions, just type them into the box, and, and either, uh, either uh, Nathan or I will go over them. So we'll stay here for 10 minutes or an hour. If you have to leave, you know, have a great day, but certainly we're going to stay on here for questions. So um, you want to read the, some of those there, Nathan, and take them? Go ahead. No, I can, uh, I can do that. Um, no, as far as Taylor, as far as the, uh, the insulation, sure, on, on a raised bed, um, you know, it's, it's going to, depend on your specific environment, but you can uh, you can certainly gain some by trying to you know insulate around that, especially if you have a raised bed. you know you can use something as simple as uh, um, as even uh, PVC pipe then on top of that to make a little structure and get some clear plastic and you know create a small structure to help modify the environment. But yeah, anything to me, anything you can do, to help to insulate is going to, you know, is only going to help moderate those temperatures. So, the growers that I work with tend to, um, uh, the the staples tend to be um, um, the spinaches, 
uh, and um, chard and turnips. Turnips are getting to be a really big one, and specifically the variety Hakiri turnip. Um, they're really liking those real well, and uh, the uh, the uh, the spinach and and the turnips and what have you. If you've ever I, I, I can't stand turnips, but I love these Akiri turnips grown in the fall because of what Nathan talked about at the start. The, the inside, you know, the, we, we increase the soluble sugars in that, and it tastes just like eating an apple. So you never had spinach. If you have spinach on Christmas Day out of one of these structures, you'll never have tasted spinach quite like like you will have, you know, on December 25th. Uh, the taste is completely different when you're working with your clients. You know, let them let, let them know that it's going to be different. And you know, it's spinach is really good, you know, in in May and June, but it's just unbelievable in in December. Kyle, as far as Steve's question, if you have, I have some thoughts, but feel free to chime in if you have any addition additional on that. As far as the uh, talking about the uh, Passive solar radiation, like using a, uh, a a black drum full of water, um, beneficial to help in high tolerance. Uh, I certainly think that it is. I haven't worked with that. Oh, Kyle, have you had any experience with with that type of? Uh... Uh, I've just read some of the, the. There's a lot of research taking place in that right now, and I, I, it looks very promising to me. What what I've uh, worked with. Or seen some people do is they've actually been using smaller bottles uh, of water to retain heat. It's the same thing that Steve is talking about here. So I think we're probably going to see more of that in the coming years. Now, something I would add to that, uh, uh, Steve, and for the rest of you, is that um, one thing, and this is just going back from general uh, thinking of you know greenhouse management, I guess overall in kind of structure management with respect to growing plants, is that you know. Uh, if you had, say, um, you know, a structure that any areas that you could have that were painted black, maybe versus white, or if you had, so say, if it was, say, the north wall, if it was a, uh, you know, a solid wall, and obviously you're not going to get much light coming in from the north end anyhow, you know, any things like that you can do to help grab some of that sunlight can all be tools <clears throat> that you can uh, do to help gain that. Now, obviously, that isn't good during the summertime, so you have to, you know, kind of weigh some of those things out. But just, um, you know, I, I do know that things like that have been done at, with basically in that passive uh, solar radiation to help. Um, I, you know, so we haven't tried all these things, but definitely, um, you know, definitely anything you can do um, to help incorporate, you know, more darker surfaces that are going to absorb some of that heat. You know, to me is is only going to help you. So, and that's hopefully things that we'll learn. Especially if and you have anybody else out here have. I know Sheila had some comments. Um, yeah, if any of you have you know other comments on that, certainly would love to uh, to hear that. But uh, at least logistically, that makes sense to me. So, I mean, the only thing now, and we didn't talk about this whenever a whole bunch, but when you're looking towards, I mentioned it a little bit. You know, a lot of times if you do have a high tunnel in that production system, we do use plastic, black plastic, when you're talking about early spring production. So that's why I try to differentiate so that, you know, you kind of understand that case of black plastic. Once we have more sunlight, you do get, um, you know, you are gaining a lot more um, solar radiation and helping to capture that. It's just that on a, you know, a couple, a, a run of cloudy days in December, you know, that uh, overall that black plastic isn't uh, uh helping uh, as much so uh, and as far as um, some of the other the black cloth or plastic in the um, in the aisles I mean are any other areas uh, certainly I think uh, I don't know what your thoughts are I think anything you can do to you know anything that you have in there if it's in unplanted areas I certainly think that that would you know just help to capture more of that sunlight when you do have it um, I don't know. You have any other thoughts, Kyle, from your high tunnel experiences? Well, it it really kind of varies by by tunnel, you know, and the orientation and where you're at in the state or the country and that, um, you know, um, and how you manage that. I mean, if you, for instance, if with with black plastic, you know, you could probably generate a little bit more heat for a couple of hours midday if you're willing to take that on and off. 
uh, but you'd have to watch it because there's so many other variables, you know, like you talked about earlier on here with, you know, where you're at and the angle of the sun and what have you. But as a general rule, you know, the growers that I work with and like in, in, in my tunnels from a practical standpoint, I don't use anything when I'm doing fall and winter crops on, you know, in terms of plastic on black, black plastic. Sure. Um, but no, like, um, like uh, Sheila's question about like, so between like alleyways, have you tried anything like where you're not necessarily over the crop, but say in areas that you aren't going to have planted anyhow, do you think that that, uh, you know, that having that extra, um, I'd probably tend to stay away from that because you're, you know, if that, if, if all of the soil, and you mentioned earlier in your, your talk about, you know, there's a very limited amount of soil that, that is that bank within that high tunnel or, you know, if you're in a raised bed or anything like that, that you can use as a heat sink. So as much as you can do to get every square inch of that soil heated up and retaining heat, sure. you'd want to do. So I'd probably, I'd probably tend to shy away from, you know, having even the aisleways covered. Sure. I think, you know, I think that's, to me, uh, I think that's where things like some of your drums of water or, you know, say if it was something like a wall surface or something like that where you aren't covering the soil but still maybe incorporating, you know, something like that, that may be of a little more benefit versus trying to do something then that covers the soil and then you're inhibiting that, you know, that natural soil heating. Uh, obviously, one thing, uh, not to, uh, not that I'm envious, but I'm sure, Kyle, your soils up there heat up a lot faster than my, my light clay soils down here. So um, that's another thing that uh, unfortunately, or well, unfortunately for me, fortunately for you, that you probably have a benefit um, over me on that. So that's an, just another thing that I thought of. But uh, yeah, and, and this will really vary, you know, and, and uh, if you want to do a Google search sometime, the, the leader in the nation in terms of this type of growing is Michigan State University. And uh, um, Deborah's probably going to give me a smiley face. She's an alum. Uh, but they're they're selling produce from their student um, their student farm up there uh, basically every day every day of the year you know and that's in in, in Michigan so um, there's a lot to be uh, learned from them. Sure. Um, and I guess anything else on that, or I'll go on to next uh, another question here. So. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you, um, Taylor again talking about cutting the slits in the in the in a low tunnel as far as trying to uh, maintain temperatures uh, in a safe range. Um, I've worked with this some, um, actually from some of the research experience I had in, uh, actually it was when I was in graduate school, but um, this can be used, especially I see that being used like in the spring to get an early start um, because you can kind of create a micro climate with a low tunnel or just uh, you know, having things just over an individual row. Obviously, whenever if it comes to a cold, windy night, though having those slits can be kind of detrimental because you're basically, you're uh, losing a lot of that. You're still, um, you know, because you have those slits, it does provide some ventilation. So it's probably something, I guess, the overall, that would be good for, say, starting some things maybe early in the season. Um, and then maybe being mindful of a, you know, potential frosty night that might be kind of windy, you may need to do something else. But, but yeah, you can use the, uh, the what you call slitted plastic row covers, and those do help you to where you don't have to worry about it getting too hot, because especially with a plastic, light plastic row cover like that on a sunny day, um, whereas in uh, you can get super, super hot even when it's not uh, not very warm outside. But but you have to remember, and for at least for the late fall or winter production, we don't have as that slitted might not be as effective um, as it would be maybe earlier in the spring where we had daytime temperatures that can get up in the 60s, 70s range. So. Nathan, I I might add to that in, in regarding Taylor's question. There is I mentioned. Um, cold frames, uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of a, a trial applied projects up here with cold frames this year and, and uh, I have several growers that use them already. I, I use them also and I use them inside the high tunnel actually in addition to outside. But um, related to that question that they have, um, you, can get, you can get thermal vents 
uh, that you can put in these coal frames, which coal, a coal frame is basically just a wooden structure, you know, with a with a, um, a covering of glass or something or the polycarbonate greenhouse polycarbonate on top that you're basically creating, you know, this small high tunnel structure that, that Nathan's been talking about. And, and it can get very, very warm in there, even when it's cold outside. And you think of the sun, you know, how, how bright the sun can be later in the year. But you can buy thermal vents for those that at a certain temperature, uh, they automatically, it's not electric, they automatically, you know, start to, the, the, the tin in them start to open up. So that's kind of a neat thing we're going to be looking at. Sure, no, that's uh, definitely another way. But uh, any, uh, if anyone's ever been uh, been in a greenhouse, I know at least a few of you have been in a greenhouse uh, during the winter. You know that even on a sunny day in a greenhouse, it can be nine, it can be 20 degrees outside and 90 degrees inside. So, especially when you get to a small environment like a cold, um, like a cold frame or something like that, um, that can get uh, actually be amplified by the fact that you know, you have only a small space there, so. Does anyone else have any other, uh, anyone else have any other questions about, uh, um, about, you know, high tone production or just maybe questions about other things? I know I, um, you know, I tried to incorporate some things not just on high tones because uh, I don't want to don't want to exclude if you're people like me that uh, don't have a high tone there are things that you can do so don't feel as if you have to have a high tone to benefit from some of these things uh, but uh, it is another tool that is becoming very very popular and shown to be very effective at helping uh, to extend the season so I want to thank Nathan for taking the time to, to work with us today on this. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, the Small Farms uh, local food team of the University of Illinois Extension will be having a series, uh, another uh, winter webinar series coming up here starting in January. Be um, checking with your local Extension office and, and, and you'll find us uh, a lot of advertising for it. And we're going to have a, about 12 different webinars later this uh, winter and those series are very popular. We had over 600 participants last year in those. So uh, with that, thanks for joining today, and uh, uh, appreciate you uh, taking part in this, and good luck with your fall and, and winter growing, and hope to see you soon on another webinar.